My name is Dr. Shiva Joshi. This is Chef Twain. We'll be talking about plant-based diets and kidney disease. And a few disclosures of mine. I've done some consulting work. I also eat a plant-based diet. And a little bit about me. So I am a clinical assistant professor of medicine at the Grossman School of Medicine at NYU. I spend nearly all of my time at Bellevue Hospital, the storied public hospital in New York City. I'm an adult nephrologist and primary care doctor. I'm also a lifestyle medicine physician. And that is my team in the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic. And a few of my interests include disease prevention, uh, stone disease, kidney stone disease, fad diets, any sort of diets. And I've also been plant-based since 2013. So uh, I'm Chef Duane. Um, as, as you heard, I teach at two culinary programs. Uh, I'm also a kidney patient. Um, just like NEF care, um, I was diagnosed with kidney disease in the year 2000. So I think we started at the same time together, which is kind of unique. And um, I'll tell you more about my story here in just a few minutes. So my disclosures are, um, I do consulting work for Renal Tracker, and then I also uh, do some consulting work for Oska Pharmaceutical. And I never know what kind of food products I'm gonna be talking about during this presentation, so I'm gonna disclose whatever company I talk about, I don't work for them, I should, I should be their salesperson, but I'm not. <laughs> so you probably don't realize, but, um, as a kidney patient in 2000, um, I was diagnosed with minimal change disease. And before I could even get an appointment with a nephrologist, um, I crashed, went through the emergency room, admitted into the hospital. And the next morning, I met my first nephrologist who diagnosed me with minimal change disease, did the kidney biopsy, confirmed that, and then went and put me on a pretty high dose prednisone um, treatment, a few other drugs we'll talk about here in a minute. And during my time with this first nephrologist, he never talked to me about nutrition. So I want to show you the only picture ever taken of me while I was on this treatment. That really is me. And Dr. Josie and I will talk about how I went from that to this in a few minutes. So this is an overview of what we'll be talking about for the next hour or so. So we'll give a little bit of an introduction, which we did, uh, and then we'll go over some basics about both kidney disease and plant-based diets. And we'll talk about plant-based diets in kidney disease, combining the two topics. We'll also talk about some common concerns, including protein inadequacy and too much potassium. We'll wrap things up, and then Chef Duane will take over and give some uh, practical tips on how to eat a plant-based diet. So why don't we get, go ahead and get started. So let's talk a little bit about kidney disease and some basics. As I understand, we have a diverse audience. We have patients, we have healthcare professionals, we have kids, and we have people who are just itching to go to Walt Disney World. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about kidneys. So what are the kidneys? What do they do? Uh, they are my favorite organ, of course. Uh, they are important to life. Uh, they function to filter blood out of toxins uh, and they make urine. They regulate the amount of fluid that we take in. So everything we're drinking in uh, comes out through urine. Um, and if that didn't happen, uh, think of all the fluid that you drank and just staying in your body. And that's kind of what happens when the kidneys stop working. Uh, they also help maintain the electrolyte levels in the normal range. They make vitamin D and they also help make blood. Uh, so they do a whole lot and uh, they're not often uh, thought of uh, as being so important. Uh, we do have two kidneys. Uh, they're shaped like beans. They're located in the flank regions of our body. They're about the size of a fist. They filter about 140 liters of blood uh, to make one to two liters or more of urine per day, depending upon how much you're drinking. And the kidneys receive about 25% of the blood that the, uh, that the heart pumps out. So they receive a sizable percentage of the blood uh, for being just a small portion of the body. So we're going to take a little look inside the kidney. So the kidney is actually composed of about a million filtering units, and these are called nephrons. And this is actually where our field, nephrology, gets its, its name uh, from the nephron. 
and the nephron is composed of a glomerulus and tubules, and together uh, this forms uh, the function of what the kidneys do, except it's replicated uh, times a million. Uh, and a kid every kidney has about a million of these nephrons. Uh, blood flows into the kidney, goes through the glomerulus, goes through the tubules, uh, and then it comes out, uh, and then you, through this process, urine uh, is made. So chronic kidney disease is actually relatively common in society. About one in seven U.S. adults has kidney disease. That's about 30 million people. But if you have a health problem like high blood pressure or diabetes, this increases to one in three. Uh, so one in three adults with diabetes has chronic kidney disease. One in five adults with high blood pressure has chronic kidney disease. Kidney disease, fortunately, is much less common in children, but uh, fortunately, it still does happen, um, uh, which is why many of us are here today. So how do we diagnose chronic kidney disease? So the most common way we diagnose it is through the presence of blood work, and what we notice is that this GFR number, glomerular filtration rate, is decreased. I liken that number to a percentage. So if that percentage is low, less than 100%, you could think of it as being abnormal. For adults, that normal number can be around 60 or 70 or 80, depending on age, as because kidney function does decline with age. Uh, but for children, it certainly should be higher. And it's classified according to five different stages. Uh, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and stage five. Stage five being the stage of kidney disease that is uh, the worst. Um, and in that stage, if you need dialysis, then you progress to end-stage kidney disease. All of this is detected through blood work called a basic metabolic panel that is commonly ordered by physicians. And this is the most common way uh, we determine if someone has a problem with their kidneys. There are other ways that suggest uh, there may be a problem with the kidney, even if you have normal blood work. The, the other way is that the urine analysis may show that you have blood or protein or other things in your urine that shouldn't be there because the urine shouldn't be made of urine and shouldn't have these other substances uh, that are normally found in blood. The third thing is that the, we may find on a CT scan or ultrasound that the kidneys don't look right or that they may be shaped inappropriately or we may see that there's signs of damage. So that could be the third way we can diagnose chronic kidney disease. So a little comic relief in there. So this is actually my blood work. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about creatinine. Uh, creatinine is found in the blood, and its level is affected by a number of things, including diet and muscle mass. So this creatinine number can vary from per person to person, and we use that number to, in a formula to determine that GFR number, glomerular filtration rate, which is that number that we roughly correlate to a percent kidney function. This, is, uh, this number, of course, is affected by kidney function. A high creatinine means kidneys are generally doing bad, and a low creatinine means the kidneys are generally doing well. So now we'll move into the basics of a plant-based diet. So what is a plant-based diet? So there actually is no exact definition to make things confusing. Um, it, <laughs> It doesn't mean you have to be vegan or even vegetarian. It just means that your diet is mostly plants. Another way to say is that you're eating less meat and dairy than the standard American diet. So there's a lot of terms that have similar meanings. So these are all the, the phrases that people use to describe a diet that is plant-based. Uh, people have used terms like plant-dominant, plant-strong, plant-supportive, plant-leaning, plant-forward, plant-powered. There's probably even more terms out there, but they all mean the same thing, that the focus of the food is plants. And that is actually uh, a photo of uh, a breakfast I had uh, once uh, when we were vacationing in Greece. What is a plant-based diet? So these are probably terms you're more familiar with. Uh, th these are uh, uh, all examples of a plant-based diet. Mediterranean diet is a plant-based diet. So are vegetarian diets, of course. Uh, vegetarian diets, there can be a few of them depending upon what people include or exclude. So a lacto-vegetarian diet includes dairy, an ovo-vegetarian diet includes eggs, 
A lacto-ovo vegetarian diet includes dairy and eggs. Uh, you could, a flexitarian diet could be plant-based. A pescatarian diet can be plant-based. That includes fish. A uh, reducitarian diet, which just means that you're reducing the amount of meat. Uh, uh, a vegan diet is plant-based, so is a DASH diet, which is used to treat high blood pressure. And then also a whole food plant-based diet. So a plant-based diet can still be unhealthy. I want to make that point. Uh, it's a common question that I get. Uh, if I eat a Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger, am I scoring a win for my health? And unfortunately, your doctor says no. Um, it is made in a factory, and it has a lot of uh, added uh, uh, processed uh, substances in there, like salt and fat and things that it's not something you would naturally find in a field growing. Um, it's, made, it's processed. Uh, it's unhealthy. Um, and a healthy plant-based diet is uh, something that has a lot of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, things that you might find growing naturally um, uh, in the world. So plant-based diets are often seen as being restrictive or limiting. Uh, but I, in my own experience and in the experience of my patients, it can actually be liberating because you find yourself eating things that you normally wouldn't have eaten otherwise. Uh, and this inc includes fruits that you may not have eaten otherwise, vegetables you may not have eaten otherwise, uh, whole grains, uh, grains you may not have even heard about. Um, uh, uh, you can also eat legumes, lentils, uh, nuts and seeds. So it does expand the diet and certainly for patients with kidney disease where uh, patients have historically been told you can't eat these foods for various reasons, potassium, phosphorus, and protein. This is actually can be very liberating. So now we'll combine the two topics, plant-based diets in kidney disease, and this is where things get interesting. So this is a graphic from a recent paper, and we basically summarize all the potential benefits of a plant-based diet in kidney disease. So it can prevent many of the common causes of kidney disease. So at least for adults, the number one cause of kidney disease is diabetes. Number two cause is high blood pressure. Uh, eating a healthy plant-based diet can not only help prevent those causes, it can treat those causes, and in some cases even reverse those causes. So if you can address the cause of kidney disease, you can potentially uh, affect the, the uh, uh, kidney disease itself. These diets also have the potential to reduce the complications of kidney disease. So this includes phosphate levels, uh, levels of acid, also known as metabolic acidosis. Uh, it can also affect blood pressure, as we talked about, especially blood pressure that comes from having kidney disease. Uh, the production of toxins that accumulate in the blood when kidney function declines. And then also affect mortality. Um, unfortunately, mortality increases in kidney disease. Uh, for a lot of reasons, and eating a healthier plant-based diet may have helped with that. And then finally, there may also be some benefit with eating this diet in regards to the actual decline of the kidney function itself. Uh, it may help temper that decline in GFR, glomerular filtration rate, and also reduce levels of proteinuria. So we're just going to do glancing blows on each of these topics. Um, uh, you could spend a lifetime talking about each one, and trust me, I have, <laughs> um, um, or it feels like I have, and uh, certainly pretty much on every one of these topics we've uh, written a paper on almost. Um, but uh, so we'll take a moment to talk about high blood pressure. Um, so why does plant-based foods help with high blood pressure and animal-based foods don't? And it goes back to some of the basics in regards to blood pressure. A lot of animal-based foods are just higher in sodium and lower in potassium. Sodium raises blood pressure, potassium lowers it. Uh, Animal-based foods tend to cause people to gain weight for a lot of reasons. They tend to be calorically dense, fat dense. Um, even the amino acid types uh, can affect uh, blood pressure. Uh, and they tend to find unfavorable amino acid types in animal protein. And there tends to be more oxidative stress and inflammation with animal protein. Pretty much everything happens in reverse when you eat plant protein. These foods are, tend to be lower in sodium, higher in potassium, affecting all that all-important sodium-potassium ratio for blood pressure. Uh, plant foods have been associated with weight loss uh, time and time again. Uh, also, these uh, proteins have favorable amino acid types. They also reduce inflammation and stress. And they also have natural alkali. So we've all heard of alkaline water, but there's also alkaline foods. Alkaline foods are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, things like that. 
you really have to push to get this going. Uh, why do plant-based diets help with preventing and treating diabetes and obesity? Uh, so in regards to obesity, these foods have a lot of fiber. Fiber has no calories, believe it or not. It was the original weight loss substance. Uh, the fiber in these foods helps, fe helps you feel full without adding calories. Uh, because of that fiber and the associated water content, these foods have a lower caloric density. And this translates into people just eating less calories within a day. Uh, these foods also tend to be low in fat. They also tend to not be as processed, and they also tend to have less sugar. And many of the things that affect obesity also affect diabetes, at least type 2 diabetes. Uh, it can help people with weight loss, improved insulin sensitivity, lower glycemic index, and then also improved insulin secretion. So as you can see, plant-based diets have a lot of potential benefits uh, in regards to some of the most common conditions that we see uh, uh, in the clinic. Moving more towards complications of kidney disease, we'll talk a little bit about phosphate levels. Phosphate levels are a big problem um, because once they start to climb, we often have to give pills and many pills at that to bring those phosphate levels back under control. Those are called phosphate binders. Plant foods do have phosphorus and because of this, they have historically been avoided in the diet of patients with kidney disease. However, that is changing as we've come to learn that a lot of that phosphorus um, uh, it tends not to be bioavailable. Or what does that mean? That means that it tends not to be absorbable. And that is because of the phytate that binds to the phosphorus. So a lot of that phosphorus just passes right through. And there's this thing called the rule of thirds. And basically what it means is that most plant foods have about one-third bioavailable phosphorus. Animal-based foods have about two-thirds bioavailable phosphorus, and processed foods are about three-thirds uh, bioavailable. Uh, so if you look at the uh, nutrition, well, it's phosphorus is not a nutrition label, but if you Google it and you find the content of phosphorus uh, on a particular food item, not all that phosphorus will be absorbed unless it's a processed food. Um, so what you do is you multiply the estimated bioavailability to determine the net phosphorus that it's ultimately absorbed because some of that phosphorus just passes right through um, and is eliminated in, uh, uh, with a bowel movement. There is a caveat to this in that uh, some of that phosphorus that's bound to phytase uh, can be uh, disrupted and can be turned uh, and can, you can increase the percent bioavailable phosphorus in these foods. Um, and this is um, through industrial processing. So like I said, processed foods, baked bread, uh, dark sodas are classic examples. Um, but uh, fortunately, with home cooking, uh, in ge uh, general home cooking, uh, this won't affect it. But if you do intense home cooking, you can certainly do that. And I have a, uh, additional slides on that. But uh, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I did not include it in this PowerPoint. Uh, but to continue our trek through the potential benefits of plant-based diets uh, in kidney disease, a big benefit is actually in regards to acid levels. So one of the many things that the kidney does uh, on a day-to-day -day basis without um, uh, us ever noticing is that it actually regulates the amount of acid in our blood. It keeps that pH, uh, all-important pH level in the normal physiologic range around 7.4. And it does that by excreting or eliminating acid that we eat in our diet. Where does that acid come from? That acid comes from uh, mostly animal proteins, believe it or not. Uh, so the standard American diet tends to be net acid uh, or acidic uh, because the diet is high in animal protein and low in fruits and vegetables. Uh, unsurprisingly, someone who's doing the opposite or eating a vegan diet actually has a neutral or even alkaline type of diet. And you can see here on this graph that some foods tend to be more acid producing, whereas others tend to be more base producing. Acid producing foods are going to be your cheeses, egg yolks, meat, poultry, fish. And then as you move into the middle, you start getting grains, rice, and pasta. Uh, you also get milk, yogurt, lentils right there in the middle with wine and coffee. And then as you start moving towards the under, other end, the alkaline foods are going to be your fruits, vegetables, spinach. And then all the way at the other end, you have raisins. Uh, and that's just because raisins are dehydrated, so it concentrates that, uh, the, the alkali 
uh, in the food. This is important because many patients with kidney disease are often given the substance called sodium bicarb or bicitra, there's other things, or baking soda even, um, and that is to neutralize the acid that is in the blood that is actually coming from the diet. So you might be able to see where I'm going with this. It's actually possible to treat this condition just by eating more fruits and vegetables than t taking in prescription sodium bicarbonate or baking soda or some of these other uh, medications that we often prescribe. And studies have shown this, several randomized controlled trials have shown that just two to four cups of fruits and vegetables per day is all that's needed to, uh, to treat uh, this condition of having too much acid in the blood. And the reason being is that fruits and vegetables have natural alkaline, they have citrate, malate, bicarbonate, and this has been shown through CKD stages one through five. Not only that, uh, fruits and vegetables are really impressive at also helping people lose weight. We talked about that earlier. They have a lot of fiber, they have a lot of water, they help people feel full. Uh, these foods are not calorically dense, they don't have a lot of calories. So it's not surprising just by adding a few cups of fruits and vegetables, patients are also able to lose weight. They're also able to lower their blood pressure and also reduce the amount of protein in their urine, which is all very impressive. These things don't happen with prescription sodium bicarbonate. So this is the extra added benefit of eating healthier. Not to mention all the other potential benefits you could get uh, with eating more fruits and vegetables, eating more fiber in regards to diabetes or cholesterol, any other things that you get just by eating healthier. And of course, there was no increase in potassium levels. And this graph um, has a lot of information despite being uh, unassuming. So there's actually three graphs listed here. Uh, there's uh, the one on the left, the one in the center, and one on the right. The one on the left shows what happens to a group of people who have kidney disease with an EGFR starting just below 40, maybe 39, and uh, what happens to them if they have metabolic acidosis or this condition of too much acid in the blood and we don't treat them with anything. No prescription sodium bicarbonate, no fruits and vegetables, just we let them go and we see what happens. What happens is that their kidney function does decline over time and at the five year mark their kidney function is about half from what it was started. It went down to about 21, uh, that GFR number. The middle group is a group of patients who received prescription sodium bicarbonate, that uh, the baking soda that the doctor prescribed, they were told to take it, they took it twice, three times a day. What happens is, is that the kidney function doesn't decline as fast. They're able to have more GFR at year five compared to someone who didn't take anything. That's really impressive, and this is why we give sodium bicarbonate to all of our patients. The interesting thing about this, and the reason I mentioned this graph, is that the last graph on the right shows you can do the same thing by giving people fruits and vegetables twice a day, or, or however many times it's needed, two to four cups per day. Uh, you can achieve that same slowing of decline in kidney function at by year five, uh, and instead of giving them sodium bicarbonate, you give them fruits and vegetables. So it's really impressive, and the question I get is, what fruits and vegetables were they eating? The fruits that were provided were apples, apricots, oranges, peaches, pears, raisins, strawberries. Uh, vegetables included carrots, cauliflower, eggplant, lettuce, potatoes, spinach tomatoes, and zucchini. So these are all things you can find in your local grocery store. Uh, and more interesting than that, these are foods that have historically not been recommended in patients with kidney disease because of their potassium content. You'll see that tomatoes are listed there, potatoes are listed there, uh, and patients uh, did not have any increase in their potassium levels. Uh, and they also had improvements in their blood pressure and their weight. Four kilograms of weight loss, uh, which is close to nine or 10 pounds. Uh, they also had lower blood pressures, eight millimeters of mercury systolic. Moving along in our tour of the plant-based uh, diet uh, and kidney disease literature, uh, we're gonna change gears here and talk a little bit about mortality. Uh, the reason I talk about it uh, is because um, unfortunately mortality is a big issue in our patients. Many of our patients worry about progressing to dialysis. My biggest worry is that will they even have the opportunity to progress to dialysis? And this study is a meta-analysis of six prospective cohort studies. Uh, so this is a summary study. So it looks at individual studies, combines that information, and gives us a summary answer. 
And what this showed was that people who ate a healthy dietary pattern, which included more fruits, more vegetables, uh, more fish, legumes, cereals, whole grains of fiber, and less red meat, salt, and refined sugars, had a lower risk of dying uh, compared to those who didn't. Um, about 27% decreased risk of dying. Uh, fish is seen as a gray food, not only within the uh, kidney literature, but beyond the heart literature and many other uh, uh, areas of medicine. Some studies show it being favorable, some studies show it do not. In this study, it had a favorable effect, um, but the emphasis is on eating foods that consistently have shown benefit, which is our, your whole unprocessed plant foods. Fiber is the unsung hero of health, and, and that is applicable to kidney disease as well. Fiber was used as an experimental treatment for kidney failure 40 years ago because it reduced uh, levels of toxins, including urea, nitrogenous waste. Fiber has been associated with a reduction in mortality, reduction in cardiovascular disease in patients with kidney disease. And the reason being is because of all the things that you see in this diagram here. Um, it helps reduce the acid load, um, helps with the gut microbiome, uh, it helps with uh, in, uh, inflammation, cholesterol, uh, all these things. In one study, every extra gram of fiber was associated with a 11% reduction in cardiovascular events. Just one gram of fiber was associated with more than a 10% reduction in cardiovascular events, which is pretty impressive. <clears throat> So a big question I get is, will eating a plant-based diet uh, help me with my kidney disease? And in observational studies, so non-controlled non trial studies, uh, patients eating plant foods are associated with a lower risk of developing protein in the urine, developing kidney disease, and developing fa uh, kidney failure. So there certainly are encouraging results that are uh, worth noting. Uh, we can't say definitively because we don't have not we have not had the studies that are needed to to say this definitively. Those studies have not occurred uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but what we have seen when looking at people who tend to eat this way, this is what we find. For those with kidney disease, we have seen that plant foods do lower the amount of protein in the urine, and they do slow down the uh, decline in kidney function. So that is good. So. In general, why might animal protein be detrimental to kidney function? There's a lot of reasons. Um, one is this issue of hyperfiltration, which is putting the kidneys into overdrive, is, like, is how I like to explain it. Uh, the kidneys can uh, uh, manage their kidney, the amount of filtering that they do according to the level of need to an extent, and you, we can do that by eating more protein. So people who tend to eat a plant-based diet tend to eat less protein, and even the protein quality can affect that itself. So eating the same amount of protein, if you get it from a plant source, a vegetarian source, you can actually reduce the amount of overdrive that is happening in a kidney. So that's a, even yet another benefit uh, to eating a plant-based diet. We talked about the acid load and how these foods are naturally alkaline. Uh, microbiome fiber is excellent for microbiome. Uh, the sodium content of these foods is also important. Uh, people. Uh, patients who eat too much sodium tend to have high blood pressure, tend to have leg swelling, especially in kidney disease. Uh, plant foods are known for being superfoods because of their antioxidant potential. Uh, and they also have just a lot of other beneficial substances like phytonutrients, vitamins, and minerals that are all helpful. So in a paper that we published last year, uh, we basically summarized all of this information. And if you want any of these papers or have any questions on any of the things we talked about, you, I will put up uh, my email at the end. And you're more welcome to email me. And I'm happy to share these papers. Uh, but we put in the summary table of why eating a plant-based diet and kidney disease uh, can be so beneficial. And it's for the reasons that we talked about. It can help treat the causes of kidney disease, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. It can also help with the progression of disease, and it can also help with the complications of kidney disease. So this uh, seemingly trivial aspect of uh, our life, where we, uh, the foods that we eat, can have a really big impact on our health. So getting closer towards the end of uh, my portion of this talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about common concerns. Uh, the common concerns historically have been potassium and protein. 
Plant foods have historically been excluded from kidney uh, diets or renal diets because of their potassium content. However, recent research suggests that this risk may be overstated and that we may be able to eat uh, these foods without any issue. The reason being is that these foods are high in fiber. Fiber keeps coming up as a savior for many aspects of health, and yet again, it does so for potassium. The reason fiber is important is that you actually lose potassium with each bowel movement. Every time you go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement, uh, fiber helps you lose, uh, excrete more potassium. Uh, leads to larger, more frequent bowel movements, um, and this leads to more potassium loss, which is a good thing in kidney diseases as many, many patients have run to this issue of having high potassium levels. Not only that, the body has this amazing homeostatic mechanism that it senses when potassium levels are starting to rise because the kidney's not working, and it tells the colon to start secreting more potassium. This is actually a new finding. Um, well, the finding's actually been around for several decades, but it's actually only been recognized as of recently. Up to 30% of the potassium you eat, in, you eat in a diet can be excreted in your colon, which is amazing. Not only that, these foods also can help move potassium out of the blood and into different compartments of the body back into cells because of their alkaline content, their fiber content, and also improving insulin sensitivity. Also, there may be a bioavailability component to the potassium, meaning that in the same way as phosphorus, potassium may not be easily absorbed if it comes from a plant-based source. We summarized this in a recent paper. Uh, my research assistant wrote this paper, and he came up with this uh, brilliant title calling uh, the paper, Taking the Kale Out of Hyperkalemia. And it basically summarized that there is nearly no increase in potassium uh, in patients eating a plant-based diet. This is a table of studies, and each study looked at it a different way. They had uh, patients, uh, participants, eating different amounts of plant foods or foods that contain potassium, and, uh, and it showed that except just for one instance in all of these studies, um, uh, there was no hyperkalemia. And that person who did have an elevated potassium level or hyperkalemia, uh, it was due to a pre-existing condition that causes hyperkalemia in the first place. And then in regards to protein, plant-based diets can provide protein. They do have protein. Uh, uh, pay, uh, people eating plant-based diets without kidney disease have been able to get enough protein. They don't just waste away, um, as is the common uh, misconception. And then also patients eating plant-based diets with kidney disease uh, can get enough protein. That's been shown in uh, research studies as well. And uh, this has been shown for patients uh, on dialysis and off of dialysis. Of course, if you are moving in this direction, uh, it's always recommended to see a dietitian, specifically a renal dietitian, trained with this familiarity in plant-based diets. Um, I know that it may not be possible to find one in your area, but I have a list on my website um, that has uh, a bunch of uh, uh, names in case anyone's interested. So to wrap up, uh, or get close to wrapping up my portion, um, I wanted to uh, let you know that the renal diet as we know it, what we think people, patients should be eating on a renal diet is changing. I've had a small role in this and I'm proud to have been involved in this process. The new renal diet we hope um, will be this called the Plato diet, uh, which stands for a plant dominant low protein diet. I didn't come up with the name, but I am glad that uh, some of my work is uh, reflected in this. It takes into account eating a low protein diet, which we didn't talk about too much, but eating a low protein diet does help with that overdrive issue in kidney disease, the hyperfiltration. I'm not saying you should eat no protein or avoid eating protein, which is what some of my patients have mistakenly understood as me saying. I'm saying that you should avoid eating protein excess. So don't make your whole diet protein. There are other substances you can eat, fiber, carbohydrates, fat, that can help you reduce this issue of putting your kidneys into overdrive. It can help you preserve your kidney function for longer. The other aspect of this, the other arm of this, is eating plant foods for all the benefits that I mentioned earlier. Plant foods have a lot of potential benefits, um, which we discussed in regards to the causes, the complications of kidney disease, and even affecting kidney disease itself. Uh, this contributes to a revised uh, diet that we uh, call the plant-dominant low-protein diet. High in fiber, low in sodium, uh, gives you enough energy, and uh, we hope it achieves all these hard endpoints that we, we think this diet can achieve. 
uh, um, and, uh, and it tends to be safe and tolerable. But again, it should be done in a conjunction with someone who knows uh, uh, what they're doing, a nephrologist, uh, also a dietitian, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, you're on the right path. A lot of my work is focused on just moving people along the spectrum. Some people think that it's perfection that I'm trying to reach, but that is not the case. Uh, we are all human, uh, and I will mention that uh, momentarily. Um, but uh, it's just to move from our extremely unhealthy diet, the standard American diet, just along the spectrum to whatever we feel comfortable with at that time to being healthier, because I do think a lot, well, I know, because if I see my patients, uh, that a lot of us have that opportunity or potential to improve at least some aspects of our diet. I know that personally, myself, uh, because uh, I once had uh, prediabetes, high cholesterol, kidney stones, all these health problems. Uh, when I was a resident, this, that is an actual undoctored photo of me as a resident, uh, smiling, uh, despite probably working uh, a lot and not having slept and whatnot. Um, and uh, when I was a fellow, I got featured in the newspaper um, for having uh, prediabetes and then turning my life around through this process. So not only has it affected my research interests, my professional management, but also my personal life. So how does one eat plant-based and be healthy? Uh, the illustrious chef Dwayne will go in more into this, but I just wanted to give um, a brief overview. So it's just eating more of these foods. If you like some aspect of these foods, um, start with that. Eat more of that. If you like for fruits, if you like bananas and apples, start eating more of that. For vegetables, whatever is it, zucchini or tomatoes, start making recipes that include that. Whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts and seeds. Um, start with what you feel comfortable with. If you buy foods that you don't know what they are, how to cook them, you don't like eating them, chances of success are not very high. So start with what you know and build off of that. And then also try to avoid, eat less of these foods, processed foods. You can be plant-based and be unhealthy um, by eating Oreos, Twizzlers, French fries, um, but that's not the, the, the idea of health. That's not the picture of health. Uh, animal foods, red meat, pork, dairy, chicken, eggs, fish. Uh, fish is a great gray, uh, gray food, uh, so if you want to include that, that's fine. Fried foods, uh, definitely eliminate add sh added sugars you want to get rid of, and also fast food. These are my five tips, and this is what has helped uh, me to make your own meals with plants instead of meat. So to use seitan, tofu, tempeh, uh, fake meat, if it's a stepping stone, these can be processed uh, and have phosphorus and sodium and all these unnatural, unhealthy things. Um, and then you also want to start with your favorite dishes. I am uh, an Indian American. One of my favorite dishes growing up was palak paneer, which is spinach with uh, these cheese cubes. It's absolutely divine. I've replaced it with tofu. Um, it's still pretty good and a lot healthier. Uh, my cholesterol is a lot lower because of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, eat more fruits. Uh, they were the original fast food. I try to include it for breakfast every day. Uh, eat a salad every day. Um, it just takes the thinking out when you go to a restaurant. Just skip to the salad menu. Find what you like. Customize it. Take some things out. Substitute some things. Um, and uh, your body will thank you for it. Don't buy unhealthy foods in the first place. If you buy unhealthy foods, uh, you're setting yourself up for disaster. I, I have a vice of Doritos. If I buy Doritos, they will be gone before I even check out. Um, if someone around me buys them, I will eat them. Uh, everyone has been warned and has, has knows this issue with me. They're not even allowed to open a bag or show a bag to me because I will eat it. Um, so don't buy it. And tell your friends and family, don't buy it for you. <clears throat> That's just sabotage. Um, give, your time, uh, give yourself time and patience. This is a long process. You're overcoming years of societal, uh, familial, cultural influences, habits. Habits are hard to break. Even addictions to some substances like sugar and fat and things, it is difficult. And you will have setbacks. You will go off the path. Um, but the idea is, is that to preserve your health, it's a, it's a long-term journey. So this is an example of my diet in a typical day. This is actual what I did probably around the time that I made this uh, breakfast, a bowl of mixed cut fruits, um, various fruits. I may have a granola bar instead if I'm in a rush for lunch. I usually have a wrap. 
uh, different types. I have this place that I go to. I get the wraps when I'm at work. Or I have a salad for dinner. We typically do a sandwich or we do uh, purple carrot, which is like Blue Apron, uh, but makes plant, they send you plant-based meals and we cook them. Um, if uh, both of us being very busy, we, it'd be nice if we could just go do this ourselves, but we found that this works for us. Uh, for snacks, I typically do dried fruit. Uh, I may have chips and guac or some mixed nuts, uh, and beverages, tea, coffee, and lots of water. These are some great resources. I don't have an association. Um, well, I am associated with several of these. I don't get paid by any of these. Um, so you're welcome to uh, uh, use them. You're more welcome to use whichever one you want of your own that you find. Uh, these are just some that uh, I found uh, useful, some that we use even in our clinic. Uh, Forks Over Knives is probably by far one of the biggest uh, repositories of information, uh, articles, uh, recipes, uh, stories, the books. Uh, there's a whole line of things, even a magazine. Uh, nutritionfacts.org and then uh, Michael Greger's series, uh, who runs that website. Uh, he has a series of books that are uh, pretty detailed. Uh, uh, the Proof is in the Plant um, by Simon Hill. There's plenty of cookbooks out there. Um, I was going to add a few more names onto here, but Amazon has recently exploded. So you can find whichever one uh, you like online with a particular twist, if it's uh, Southern or if you're Indian or whatever your uh, uh, cuisine that you like or you're looking for, there is uh, something for everyone. Can, can I add one more? Yeah. Um, yeah. I use Veg Web, just V E G Web. It's a great way to get started because they have tons of vegetable recipes, so you get to go through and pick what you like to start with. And on that? Well, you're going to help with this one because you can <laughs> talk about the medical side. So, um, my first nephrologist never talked to me about nutrition. Um, and you can, I think it's the next slide. That's that ugly guy again. That, I had a boss see this driver's license picture and told me I look like a terrorist. So um, this is what I look like working with a nephrologist who never talked to me about nutrition. Um, after about five months, I went out and seeked a couple consults. So um, my brother-in-law, who is an attorney, um, he does a state law, and he kept saying, look, I work with this nephrologist. I want you to go see her. I said, sure. And so I, he said, I'll call and make an appointment. I said, OK. So my brother-in-law, the attorney, calls Dr. Tuttle and says, this is your attorney. Call me back. Click. So poor Dr. Tuttle thought she was getting sued. So when she calls her attorney, he goes, no, no, no. I just want you to see my brother-in-law. And I think she said yes out of the relief she wasn't getting sued. So I went to Dr. Tuttle, and she said, you know, this is manageable. You should, you know, your kidneys are stressed out. You should probably decrease the animal protein. It will help your kidneys. Well, being a typical patient, I really didn't listen to my doctor like I should have. Um, so I uh, waited a f about another year. And um, I have a friend who teaches nutrition at uh, one of the schools I work at. And she was following my case. And, um, every month I would send her a copy of the labs and she'd be freaking out, you know, my triglycerides were high, my cholesterol was high, you know, everything was not in whack, it was all out of whack. So she came in my office on a Thursday morning and said, Dwayne, I want to challenge you. I, wanted, I want you to take you off of animal protein for 90 days and let's just see what happens. You've been sick for a year and a half. And I said, okay, great. Should we start tomorrow? And she said, no, I want you to wait till Monday morning. And I said, well, OK, what's so special about Monday morning? She goes, I want you to have the weekend to eat what you want. I heard her say, eat as much as you want. <laughs> so being a kidney patient, working, I was exhausted. I come home Friday afternoon. Um, at this time in my life, my kids were fairly small. And about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, my kids come up to me and they say, Dad, we want pizza for dinner. And I'm like, perfect. Ah, my first night of eating at whatever I want, I don't have to cook. Don't worry, kids, I'll take care of this. So family of four, two small kids, I ordered four large pepperoni pizzas with extra cheese. I heard the dietician say I could eat it, OK? <laughs> No dietitian in their right mind would give this guy four pizzas. But anyway, so we had pizza for dinner. 
And about two o'clock in the morning, I got the flu, I thought. I was so sick. I was so sick, I couldn't eat the entire rest of the weekend. And about Sunday afternoon, because I'm kind of slow, it dawned on me, oh, the pizza did this. And I'm a kidney patient. So Monday morning, I got up, and I was very motivated to change my diet. I also am an egotistical chef who's been around food all his life and thought, this is going to be a piece of cake. It was not easy, not easy at all. Um, I had not even taken into the concept of changing an eating habit, a pattern that had been there for 40 years. Plus, my dietician goes, I need you to write down what you eat for the first week because I want to see how you're doing. And I'm like, OK, so I hand her my food log. Good friend of mine starts reprimanding me using four-letter words because I'm not creative. And I'm like, honey, this is not easy. And she goes, yes, it is. You're a chef. You know food. I've told you the parameters. Now do it. Okay. Well, by week two of this, even though my diet wasn't creative when I first started, I actually started feeling better. A year and a half of medication never, ever, ever made me feel better. So I called my doctor, Dr. Tuttle, and I said, why aren't you putting all of your patients on this diet? And she said, Duane, I have patients from Montana. They raise beef. I go, got it, doctor. I completely understand. Okay, We have to do this tactfully, but we can make changes. So I'm excited to be here because I love talking about food, and I love talking about kidney disease. And I'm one of those strange patients. I love my disease. It's actually made me a better cook. Anybody can take salt and make food taste good. It's how do you make food taste good with the parameters that our health team gives us, OK? So you, do I, you give the medical side of this yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. So to clarify, I was not uh, Chef Duane's uh, nephrologist, but I did read the paper of his story. Um, there's actually several papers of his story. Chef Duane um, is rather humble and won't tell you this. So he, he is a man of many skills. Um, uh, not only was he a patient, but he's also a chef, but he also has contributed to the literature and expanded not only my knowledge, but now uh, everyone's knowledge here on his disease state and what has, uh, what has happened. Um, so at the time, so this is the, the paper uh, of him, and I've highlighted his name. His treating nephrologist uh, is Dr. Tuttle, um, and then the last author is Dr. Kramer, all uh, big names in the field of nephrology. 44-year-old um, guy with obesity, uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure, uh, now we know why, is from the pizza. Uh, <laughs> Um, nephrotic range proteinuria, so nephrotic range proteinuria means a lot of protein in his urine, uh, that's not good, and a creatinine of 2.0, and that number, as I mentioned earlier, as that creatinine level goes up, uh, the kidney function goes down. He was biopsied, he had minimal change disease, uh, he had it as an adult because that's actually a common disease seen in children as well, um, so relevant for this audience. And um, so I reached puberty at age 40, is what I tell people. <laughs> um, he was unresponsive to steroids, which is what we commonly use in this disease, and, uh, and then also uh, immunosuppression that we started using, including cyclosporin. This creatinine number, the kidney function got worse, so his EGFR percent kidney function declined. Uh, he was then switched to a different immunosuppressive regimen. He was kept on the steroids, but added on uh, mycophenolate, and uh, his creatinine improved slightly. Uh, Proteinuria came down, uh, but then uh, he, as, a, as the report uh, describes, he adopted a whole food, plant-based, vegan diet, started swimming, um, lost 60 pounds, BMI fell to 24, his creatinine improved to 1.2, his urine albumin level came down to 12, which is uh, below, is, it is in the normal range. And most importantly, he regained his life to tell that story, to be here, uh, um, and to continue his work as a chef, uh, as an educator, um, and to spread awareness. So I just want to take the swimming component and brag just a little bit. 
Um, we have, we're the only community college in Washington State with a swimming pool, and I like to swim, and so there's a lifeguard there who was literally 30 years younger than I was, and he challenged me to do a 10-mile swim one quarter. He beat me, which was fine. The next quarter, he goes, Dwayne, I want to do a 100-mile swim in 10 weeks. 10 miles, one a week, two miles a day. I think I can do that. He said, all right, so we're going to start spring quarter, 10 weeks. We're going to see who can reach the 100-mile mark first. I beat him by four hours. <laughs> wow. So. And it's because of the plant-based diet, I have to tell you. All right. Look at him now. <laughs> so this is uh, his own words, and I shared this in uh, my PowerPoints, um, just because it just gives light to patients. I include this for my talks with physicians, because as physicians, we see patients at their worst. But it's helpful to know how high patients can fly when they're healthy. Um, because that's what the patient sees, that's what they're missing, and our job as physicians is to help them get back to the life that they were living, to back to doing this. And Dwayne's story is really impressive. I, I, do you want to read? These, these are actually your words. It would be weird for me I to just, read. <laughs> what it's just telling you is I gained my life back, um, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I can't believe that diet had such an impact. Um, when Dr. Tuttle suggested um, I go to a plant-based diet, literally it was just a couple years ago, I asked her, I said, what did you expect when you prescribed that to me? And she said, you know, I expected to see a slight significant improvement in your kidney function. I never anticipated 20 years ago that you could get into complete remission. And I've been that way for 20 years. So if there's anything I, you can take away from today is it, just try it. No one ever told me I could feel better. Nobody ever even told me there was a chance, because 20 years ago, they didn't have all this research to prove it. All right, so Dr. Josie, which is pretty impressive, because when you're a chef, your medical team doesn't give you any nutritional guidelines on how to do something, because they're like, well, you're a chef, go figure it out, and so that's, how my consults have been. So fortunately for you, if you're not a chef, those renal dietitians and those doctors will treat you a little better, okay? So I wanted to take Dr. Josie's five tips, and if, if I was a patient of his, how would I implement them? So we're gonna break these five down. Go ahead, keep going. I think it's nice that you at least gave your, you tell your patients, here are some tips. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we're gonna keep going. We're gonna go to number one. Okay. So, first thing, start with breakfast. Breakfast is the easiest meal to make into a plant-based. If you already eat cereal, oatmeal, you've already started that, okay? And think about it, there's 21 meals in a week. If you go breakfast, you've, ac you've accomplished a third of your meals, okay? So I always tell patients, start with breakfast. It's by far the easiest to convert to plant-based. Then we'll start working on dinner, okay? Because I think dinner is the most challenging. So start with success, all right? Let's go to your next tip. All right, so when it comes to dinner, think about the flavors that you like. For me, I was really excited when I figured out ethnic cuisines were much more plant-based than a typical American diet. So find one of those ethnic cuisines you like. And I'm gonna give you a couple tricks here. So if you like Italian, okay, you don't have to have everything with tomato sauce. You can do a white sauce made with plant-based milk. The key is add a lot of garlic, add a little spinach, turns it green, and you're gonna love it. Trust me, okay? If you like Hispanic Mexican food, um, I've been to some great restaurants where they served roasted cauliflower tacos. I would have never thought of putting cauliflower in the middle of my taco, okay? Um, I also heard a recipe, I haven't been able to track it down yet, but I heard of a recipe where you take cooked lentils, black beans, and walnuts, 
and you put that in the food processor and you season that up with salt-free taco seasoning and it makes a great taco burrito filling, okay? During, at the beginning of the pandemic, most people started learning how to cook and bake. When you're a chef, that isn't what you do, and you're a kidney patient. I went the other way and knocked on the door of a spice company and said, you people need to be creating some salt-free herb blends. And during the pandemic, this spice company had totally focused on restaurants. So they lost all of that business and I had their attention. Timing couldn't have been more perfect for this. So here's another source for you, spiceology.com, spiceology.com. It's a local Spokane company in, that actually has hired one of my graduates as their food director. They have 17 salt-free herb blends. So during the pandemic, I got to do all this tasting with a spice company. Now, not all spiceology spices are salt-free, so be, be sure you look for the salt-free section, okay? And Dr. Josie just got married, so I shipped him a whole case of salt-free herb blends. They're very tasty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they, have, they actually have a taco, salt-free taco seasoning blend. They have a curry blend. Um, they have a guacamole blend. I told them you have to make a pizza one. They actually have a salt-free pizza seasoning. I've used it in restaurants. It's incredible, okay? Um, the restaurant we used it in, we lowered the sodium in their pizza sauce by 29%. We lowered the sodium in their dough by 49%. We used the salt-free herb blends, and not one customer complained that the food tasted bland. So you can do this, okay? Um, I wanna talk about Asian, I love Asian food too, okay? Um, typically Asian flavors are made with soy sauce, ginger, garlic, sesame oil. If you look at those last three, garlic, ginger, sesame oil, really, really flavorful, okay? Our culprit here is the soy sauce, right? Liquid salt. So I actually found um, you can get coconut amino now, based on the brand, but I've seen coconut aminos that it can be used as a substitute for soy sauce. Soy sauce typically has like 600 milligrams of sodium per teaspoon. Coconut aminos can have 90 milligrams. So you can see this is a big savings here when you're having to watch that sodium intake, okay? So think about the flavors that you like and then start thinking about how we can implement this in dinner, okay? Next slide. So Dr. Josie tells us to eat more fruit, vegetables. Great idea. Um, I think for our kids, we gotta make it fun, okay? Um, I actually learned this from a chef in Phoenix. He had to serve me dinner one night and he was kind of freaked out. They didn't have any plant-based desserts. And yet he made the most remarkable dessert. He just took fresh fruit, sliced it up, put it on a plate, and then he took a couple tablespoons of sorbet and let it melt over the fruit. It was phenomenal. And two tablespoons of sorbet isn't even a full serving, okay? So I wasn't getting a lot of sugar, but I was getting a lot of added flavor to the fresh fruit. So there's all these kind of tricks you can do to, because I think the key here is every kidney patient deserves flavor. If you want us to follow your advice, doctor, you gotta give us flavor, right? That's the key here, it's pretty simple. All right, your next recommendation. Don't buy unhealthy foods, okay? Before I was a kidney patient, you know those Costco bags of potato chips? Well, those are one serving. <laughs> For me, once the bag's open, it's, it's, you go to the end. And then I figured out with this diet, it's not even the potato chip taste I like, it's the crunch. I miss the crunch. So I always try to make sure and plan, I'm going to have to have snacks. Typically for me, I eat three meals a day and possibly two snacks, one in the morning, one either late afternoon, or I'm, I'm, an, I'm a night snacker, not good, I know, okay? So always try to plan for that and have it ready to go. That was a real key for me to staying on my diet. So I always try to have some fresh fruit, I try to have some veggies cut up, um, 
I, I travel all over the country. I travel with a bag of nuts in my suitcase. I can always find fruits or vegetables usually, but sometimes it's hard to get a protein source. So for me, I always travel with a bag of, of unsalted nuts. I did just read last week that I should not be doing it with peanuts. That's considered a rude person on an airplane because of peanut allergies. So I had to, I had to switch to cashew nuts for that, for this trip. So, all right, next recommendation, doctor. Give yourself time and patience, which is really true. This, I had to change the way I thought about food. I think a lot of people think about food as we're hungry, we think about it, what are we going to eat, and then we purge and forget about it till the next time we get hungry. You have to think about this as that it's constantly what are we putting in our bodies. And for me, that took this thought of, this is a real journey. If I'm gonna go on a vacation, I plan the trip. I plan where do I start, what are the things I'm going to do. I need to plan how I eat, okay? Even when I was super sick and that ugly guy in the driver's license, I would try to sleep on Saturday, cook on Sunday, so I could get through the week and follow my diet. So what I learned was that planning a meal the whole week out really made me much more efficient in the kitchen, okay? It also makes it easier to go grocery shopping, okay? And I'm an avid believer in whatever you cook, you make enough for leftovers. Especially as a kidney patient, I know I'm gonna be tired by the end of the week, I don't wanna cook, so I wanna have something I can pull out of the freezer, pull out of the fridge. So for me, as I converted my dinners to plant-based, I would always have leftovers for lunch. I'm not the salad guy like Dr. Josie, so I always like to take leftovers from last night's dinner, and that becomes my lunch the next day. Think about it, you've converted breakfast, now you're working on dinner, and you're having a leftover for lunch. Do you see how easy this journey can be of how you can switch to a plant-based diet? It's not as hard as you think. And Dr. Josie, even with the Play-Doh diet, you get to cheat, okay? You know that ugly guy in the driver's license on steroids craved cheeseburgers. Oh my gosh, I would drive by a a fast food restaurant with my head out the window like a dog, just to smell the grease in the air. Oh, it was such a rush, okay? I had to wean myself off of those meat patties. So I would literally buy a hamburger, take two bites, pull the patty out, and eat the rest. And I tr transitioned to learning, it's like, yeah, the condiments are really more important than that beef patty. So you can do this, really. I'm not that exceptional, I'm just an average Joe with an average job, I'm an average teacher, this is what I do. So you could do this. I want you to understand how easy this really is. Next recommendation. <laughs> you gotta give yourself feedback. One of the things I don't think that our medical system does really well is give patients feedback. They don't have time. I mean, if Dr. Josie and I lived in the same city, I would invite him over for dinner once a month and just drill him on what has he learned, right? Okay, but we live literally on opposite sides of the United States. So I had to figure out how do I give myself feedback? So my family evolved into their own three compartment system of how to evaluate recipes. The top of the scale is, Dad, these are restaurant quality recipes. Those are a keeper. The middle of the scale is, Dad, you need to work on this. I'm like, okay. The bottom of the scale is, hey, Dad, the dog didn't eat it. We're not going to touch it. Okay? So if the dog does the dog was always the first step. If the dog wouldn't <laughs> eat it, don't even continue with the recipe. Time to move on. All right. So as a school teacher, next slide. So as a school teacher, what I literally did was create a grading sheet for myself. How am I doing? And the scale is two ways. One is always taste. Do I like what I'm eating? And believe it or not, in today's world, I do not feel deprived on a kidney diet. And yet I know that's the number one complaint kidney patients have, okay? So on this scale, taste is very, very important. And then the second part is, am I following the guidelines? So, our school works on a four-point grade scale, so that's what I'm used to. I divided this into four sections. 
doesn't taste good, it's not healthy, probably need to quit doing it, okay? All the way to number four, it's healthy, it's meeting all the guidelines, and I like it. I even went so far as to create one of these for sodium. How, can I, how do I do it on sodium? And I did an experiment, which you should never do, but I actually wanted to know how low, how much, what's the least amount of sodium I can consume in a day if I cook my own food? Guess what I got it down to? 750 milligrams. That's not healthy. <laughs> Don't go that low, I know. Chill out, doc, it'll be okay, <laughs> okay? But I just wanted to test to see that. So if you cook your own food, it's really, really easy to control your sodium levels, okay? So if you have to control your fat, the amount of fat that you eat, you could create this same grade sheet for that. And you just monitor and give yourself some feedback. And I think it's really important that you give yourself some positive feedback, okay? I'm not perfect. I, I wished I could have told you, Pizza was the last thing I ever ate that was meat. And meats never touch these lips again. It doesn't work that way. I work in restaurants. I know meat tastes good, otherwise people wouldn't order it in restaurants, okay? So I, I have to taste the food my students cook. So for me, tasting meat is like a wine tasting. Have you ever seen wine experts, you know how they taste the wine and spit it out? And I, I tell my students, look out, give me a garbage can before you taste it. If I have to taste your meat, I gotta spit it out. I am not swallowing it no matter what, okay? And my students have really gotten excited about this because they're like, we don't wanna make you sick. And I said, you won't. But what you will learn is how to cook plant-based. I'm adamant about that, okay? So believe it or not, nine months out of the year, I have students cooking me lunch. It is awesome. Their only guidelines are it has to be plant-based, low sodium. If you give me too much salt, my feet start swelling within 15 minutes, and I can tell them within 15 minutes what they did wrong. So they get feedback right away. All right, so give yourself feedback. Next one. So how do you make a recipe kidney friendly? Every recipe, since I've had kidney disease, I look at that and analyze every recipe that comes across my desk. The first thing I look at is, is this kidney friendly? Okay, is it low sodium? Is it plant-based? If it's not, how can I change it? And it's pretty simple. You know, you ask yourself these questions. Can you replace the meat with plants? Okay. Before kidney disease, the most popular plant-based entree I've ever heard about was vegetarian lasagna. Okay, well guess what? There's a whole creative world out there besides that. Okay, and you can do a lot of things with plants. I love my diet because plants, are, you can be so much more creative. When I go grocery shopping, I realized before kidney disease, you go to the meat counter, you buy the meat, and then you create the meal around it. Now, I go to the produce section, see what's fresh, and create the meal around that. And I have a lot more options, okay? So can you replace the meat? We talked about the examples of the tacos. You can use roasted cauliflower. You can use um, seasoned tofu. You can use um, this um, lentil, black bean, and walnut mixture. So there's a lot of ways you can do that. My favorite enchiladas are made with, filled with spinach and mushrooms. And people don't think, people forget that mushrooms actually have protein. A portobello mushroom, you know those big mushroom caps? They have eight grams of protein in one mushroom cap. So you can get your protein by plant-based diets. Um, you gotta stop using the salt. That was the first thing for me. And that meant going to herbs and spices. And I think people are afraid of herbs and spices. You grew up with what your mom used, right? And my mom used about four spices, and they were, they'd been in the cupboard for about 80 years. She <laughs> never bought new spices, ever. Okay. All you have to do, um, Penzi, another company I don't work for but should, if you have a Penzi store close to you, you can go smell their spices. You don't have to buy, but you can go smell and smell and find out what you like. They also have several salt-free herb blends that are really good. Okay. So find out the herbs that you like and then start cooking with them. Okay. Another thing to do, roast your vegetables. 
put your vegetables on a sheet pan, rub them with just a little bit of olive oil, stick them in a 400 degree oven for about 40, 45 minutes, turning them every 15, 20 minutes, and you can get really intense flavor with those, okay? One exception, you probably shouldn't roast tomatoes, a little, a little high in those minerals, but you can get away with all the other vegetables. And they really add a lot of intense flavor, okay? I love this, this is all about food and kidneys, this is great. So, I look at what the doctors tell us as a game. Think about it, any game we've ever played, there are rules that you have to play by, right? And your goal is to win. So when the medical team gives us our nutritional advice, it's a game. I looked at this, I'm a horrible poker player. So I looked at this as like, well, you know what? I've seen professional poker players win lots of money with a bad hand. Okay, I was dealt a bad hand. I was given kidney disease. That doesn't mean I can't win. So you can change the diet. Now, some of you are parents. I did a, I did a project um, a few years back with um, the cooks who cook in daycares. Probably the most undereducated group of cooks I've ever worked with. Nobody gives them training, any kind of support. And what we found was that for children, if you introduce a new food to them nine times, they will eat it. Now moms, that doesn't mean you have to cook it nine times before they will eat it, okay? You can talk about it, tell them the culture, introduce it that way, and get them excited. So those are the ways that you can help your kids follow the nutritional guidelines. So, go ahead. We just want to thank uh, 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 all the, uh, well, for me, I want to thank all the people that have helped me uh, get to this uh, spot and contribute to my knowledge. I, I definitely stand on the shoulders of giants. A lot of bright minds in the field have contributed to my education. Um, and then, of course, I want to thank all of you for waking up and not riding Space Mountain this morning, but maybe this afternoon. Um, and also to Nefcure and, of course, uh, Chef Dwayne uh, for doing this presentation. Um, so please remember, this is what a patient looks like before a plant-based diet. And this is what you can look like afterwards. And that's me, and um, uh, that's my email address. Uh, you can email me, uh, you can write it down or take a photo. Um, uh, give me uh, a few days, if you do send me an email today, I might be on a Splash Mountain, and I will not be taking my laptop on Splash Mountain. Uh, at any rate, um, and then, yep, I have uh, wedding photos here. We got married in Orlando just a little less than a year ago. Um, so, just a uh, little fun photos for you both for you all. And uh, thanks again for having us, and we'll take questions. We'll be around at the break, too. Thank you so much. I have a question over here. Um, this one's for the doctor. What do you think about um, protein powder or protein drinks occasionally, say, once a week? Yeah, I think that's OK. Um, Obviously, better to get the protein from foods. Um, uh, protein uh, powders, if you do do it, try and do uh, one that is plant-based. Try to do one that has a shorter ingredient list. Um, and then also try to understand what you're trying to get out of the protein powder and why you can't get it from a meal. I, always, I think meals are better. Uh, they tend to have more vitamins, minerals, uh, fills you up. Um, you can also avoid the issue of overdoing the protein. Uh, but uh, if uh, you know, you're going to the gym and you can't, don't have time for a meal before work and you need that protein shake before you go to work, that's fine. I have a question. Um, I actually have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I'm a patient. Um, I would first start off with asking, how do you get your whole the whole household. You said you have a family of like four. How do you get the whole household on board, and I'm the only one with the kidney disease, 
and you know I got a high school age son who wants to eat his Oreos and Doritos and they're in the cabinets and you know I'm a nighttime snacker as well and I just want to eat everything that they eat um, I know it takes a little bit of self-discipline but I think how do you get the whole household on board is my first question now, second question is um, cooking your vegetables I've heard removes a lot of the nutritional value from those vegetables. You stated roasting them. Um, do they, does roasting it specifically hold that nutritional value um, in, in the vegetables versus cooking it or frying it or putting it in a pan or heating it up or microwaving? I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing, but. Um, last question I have, and I know it's a lot, but why are there no trials with the fr fr fruits and vegetables? in kidney disease. There's all these trials going on with medicines and chemicals and toxins and weird, crazy stuff. Why no trials with fruits and vegetables? I think, doctor, you talked about it for a minute, but didn't really elaborate. So that's my final question, sorry. Oh, and my, uh, her question, sorry, my wife's question is, did you find yourself when you switch over to a plant-based diet substituting more pasta? Do you just say like, I need to feel more full and I'm eating more pasta? Um, because I think that's the things that we reach to in our household them first is like, I gotta eat healthier, so I'm just gonna get spaghetti. Uh, I don't know, there's probably no nutritional value in that, but it's kind of where, where we go. Which one do you wanna take first? I think I'm gonna need to borrow someone's notepad and pens <laughs> really <laughs> to keep track. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna get, I love the questions. What, you just, you wanna go first? Okay, um, my family doesn't follow my diet. So what I started with is I cooked two meals and got exhausted very quickly. So my entree became their side dish. And then I started decreasing the animal protein I was serving them and increasing the plants and vegetables. So um, I, I still have issues, like the holidays, I had to make a promise to my family that I would never alter traditional family recipes, which I don't. But I will tell you, um, they told me the Christmas cookies last year were salty, which went, yes, yes, they're cutting their sodium down. So now I bake with no salt butter. So there's ways you can, you can transition them. I will tell you that when my son um, graduated from high school, and if you have any children that are failure to launch out of the house, start cooking plant-based, <laughs> they move out really, really quickly, okay? Um, was there another, oh, um, you don't, I understand reaching for pasta is really simple and easy, um, but you can do a lot of things, like you can use vegetables instead of pasta. You can you know, use zucchini, eggplant instead of pasta and still do the sauces on top of it. And you're cutting the carbs and still getting a lot more nutrients from it. Did we answer all three, four? Trials. Trials. So um, I love the questions. I work in a lifestyle medicine clinic at Bellevue and we deal with some of the things that you talked about. And there's no magic answer in terms of people in the household, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that's required and you may not be able to get everyone on board. It certainly helps if more people are on board, um, if, especially if they understand why you're doing it. And if, if those people in your household also have health problems, the beauty of plant-based diets is that um, it, it's this diet that throughout society and time has fed humans and kept humans relatively healthy for a long period of time. It's only recently in Western societies that we've digressed from it. And many people just in general have health problems. So it's likely that in the household someone has some health problem that could benefit from eating a plant-based diet. So it's to their advantage too and you can all do it together. Ultimately, you may not be able to get someone on board or completely to avoid phosphorus or something like that if they don't have kidney problems themselves. And that's understandable. Uh, but if you can find some sort of common ground that's helpful Communication is key, having them participate uh, in your health and helping you. Um, I guess uh, you know, that's what love and family is about. In terms of trials, um, pharmaceutical companies are these big 
companies, they, uh, they trade on the stock exchange, they have investors, they're well funded, they can do trials, they need to do trials to prove that their medication is effective, uh, they have a worthwhile purpose, role in society. The Apple company that's selling apples at you know, Publix or wherever, Kroger or wherever, um, maybe it's a small company or organization, family owned or something like that, um, and they're not traded on the stock exchange. They don't have the funding to do a trial for fruits and vegetables or, you know, that was done through the government. Um, it's a common question I get. The, the funding organizations that fund this, the research, NIH and stuff, they don't value diet as much as patients do, and it's just this discrepancy. The, where the, the hot and awesome or you know, cool thing that the people that review these proposals to fund them are looking for are like uh, uh, drugs or trials, genetics, things like that. Um, and a diet doesn't really get the attention that it deserves, and that's the unfortunate part. The, so Can I, um, you know, you're, we, you're being taught about your voice really matters, and I've been to Washington, D.C. multiple times. I, I come from Kathy McMorris Rogers District, the largest wheat producing county in the country, and I had to sit down with her and say, wheat gluten protein is really good for kidney patients. You need to be supporting NIH. I had to connect all the dots for her to show we need more research for kidney nutrition. Um, uh, I hope things change, uh, but there is actually is a sizable amount of research. When I first got into this, I didn't think there was anything, and there actually are people um, who are doing this research with whatever means they can. And the, the, the acidosis studies were actually funded through the NIH, um, and those show the benefit of fruits and vegetables for kidney disease, and that's probably some of the best studies that we have. Your roasting question, roasting can actually be beneficial, whatever food processing can be beneficial in some ways, There's, these foods still have a lot of minerals in them. Um, and for potassium, it's thought that it may help prevent the rise in potassium levels that happens in kidney disease. On the trade-off, it may help loosen that phosphorus and make it more ab absorbable. Um, you know, it's, at some point you have to eat something. So um, what, I, what we do in our clinic is we tell people to eat these healthy foods. If we run into a problem with the monitoring, if there's an issue undetected on the labs, uh, then we adjust things accordingly. Um, but it's certainly better than eating uh, Twizzlers or Oreos. I'd rather you eat uh, uh, roasted vegetables any day. And then the pasta thing, we've gravitated towards that. I'm not a big fan of just regular pasta. I'd rather, I think regular pasta is, even the whole wheat, I think there's better ways to improve pasta, like doing zoodle, zucchini. We do like red bean or red lentil pasta at times, uh, just to improve the nutrition profile, get more fiber, uh, more vitamins and minerals as opposed to just uh, uh, these refined carbs. Next question. Yeah, we have another one right here. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you could talk any more about the slide you showed regarding the increased potassium studies that were done. You said one person, I think, had experienced um, a big jump in, in potassium levels. I'm just curious because I lost a lot of weight like 10 years ago and then that happened, <laughs> like I had really bad, really high potassium, and I just kind of trended back the other way as I moved away from vegetables and things like that. Yeah, so potassium, I have a whole talk on potassium. Um, uh, the person who had developed high potassium had this condition called renal tubular acidosis, uh, type four, which you get an acidosis, but you also get an elevated potassium level due to a decreased or impaired sensitivity to aldosterone. And that was the cause for that. But that person already had this problem, uh, so it's not surprising that they started out with having high potassium and then developed high potassium levels when they went into the study. Um, at some point or another, if you have kidney disease, especially as it gets worse and worse, you probably will run into this issue. It doesn't, al it doesn't always have to be related to food. Food can cause problems. The problem substances I tell patients to avoid, especially when they get to that stage, I don't recommend it for everyone, but once you start running into problems, the things that to potentially avoid are juices, sauces, dried fruit, and of course your potassium supplements or even salt substitutes. Uh, Chef Duane was talking about to avoid salt, but don't reflexively then go to something that's salt substitute and then it uses potassium as a salt instead of sodium. 
you can then run into trouble because that potassium is 100% uh, absorbable. It goes straight into your blood and it causes problems. So what you really want to be doing is to not be cheating around this salt issue, but really using those herbs and spices that Chef Duane was talking about um, and expanding that spice cabinet. Um, the potassium issue, um, many people still think that it's related to diet and they will reflex reflexively tell you to stop eating these plant foods. Um, may or may not be accurate, it's hard to know in that situation. Um, but there's also, and when I do talk about this, uh, there's many other causes to high potassium. Sometimes medications that you're on can do it. Um, it could be even constipation. Fiber is really important um, to helping people having bowel movements and eliminating the potassium through the gut route. Um, there's health conditions separate from this that can contribute to high potassium levels. So there's a whole host of things that go into high potassium. And I think we used to think of it as just high potassium, cut out the bananas. Now we're realizing bananas don't have a whole lot of potassium compared to a lot of other things. Um, and there's a whole lot more that goes into it. So um, our thought process on it has become much more nuanced. Thank you so much for that. That was really um, engaging for both my husband and I, and I think everybody else here. Uh, my question is, how do you boost calories for a kidney patient who um, exerts himself a little much and also has a little bit of an absorption issue? So how would you boost those calories with a plant-based diet? What was that last issue you said? Uh, absorption. Absorption mm -hmm. issue. You want to take this or? You start, I'll you, finish. Okay, I love that. Um, the, what, what I tell patients is to start going into the nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds are calorically dense, so I use nuts and seeds in the way I want to for patients that need to lose weight. Be careful on using those, the nut butters, um, tahini, hummus, uh, well hummus comes from a legume, uh, but uh, for patients who need to gain weight uh, or need more calories or just losing weight for whatever reason, um, I use these things. Tahini is some of the, one of the most calorically dense things. Uh, hummus can be calorically dense, peanut butter, uh, almond butter, nuts. Uh, am I forgetting anything? No, but um, I eat oatmeal with peanut butter. Most people don't connect those two together, but you add some cinnamon to it, it's a really great flavor, and you're adding a lot more calories to it. And tahini paste can go in just about anything. Most people don't think about it, which is ground up sesame seeds. Or just even mixed nuts, uh, unsalted mixed nuts. It can pack a lot of calories. We just talk about nuts and fruits. That's what we do. <laughs> Next question. Can you talk about how the grapefruit affects medications? And also, um, second question, organic versus non-organic fruits and vegetables. How does the break, breakthrough affect medication? Grapefruit. What do you mean? Oftentimes, <laughs> you'll hear, do not eat grapefruit on this medication. Oh, grapefruit. Oh, right. Uh, transplant patients should not eat grapefruit because it inhibits, uh, oh, dusting off. I'm not a transplant nephrologist. I, it inhibits an enzyme that increases the levels of certain immunosuppressive medications in your blood. So if you fall into that category or um, are have a, taking another medication that says don't eat grapefruit, then don't, please don't eat grapefruit. Um, what was your second question? I really need a notepad. Organic. Uh, organic, if organic can be expensive, um, if you have the ability uh, to get organic, if there's two options and they're on sale and they're the same price, I always say to do the organic option. Um, it just minimizes pesticide exposure. I think the next generation probably will come to realize perhaps how bad these things are. We don't have robust evidence, certainly in the kidney literature, on this issue. My personal gut feeling is that all these chemicals in the environment aren't making us healthier. We did fine without them for millennia. Um, so I think if you have the ability, the means to do so, um, it's probably better. So the chef's got to step in here on that one. Um, it's, I think it's also better if you can buy local. So if you know local producers in your area, then you can actually talk to them. Uh, Farmers markets have been exploding across the country because I think there's a huge demand for people who want healthier food. Um, I don't have so much of a question as I just wanted to say um, I resonate with everything you've said and my family's on a plant-based diet. I've been mostly vegetarian my life. 
Um, my eldest son has nephrotic syndrome and we've kept him on a low sodium, low sugar diet. It's possible, parents. My younger one doesn't and he doesn't notice. Cinnamon, substitute for sugar, it's great. They, it actually enhances the sweetness and things. Um, we use Herbamer, salt-free, which is a salt-free substitute that makes everything taste better but with spices naturally. And coconut aminos, game changer. Um, it's down to like 90% less sodium than soy sauce. So I found these things. I live in Toronto and there's a lot more in the US, I know, but um, in Toronto we've been able to supplement everything. And I don't know if it's necessarily helped his nephrotic syndrome, but it hasn't worsened and he's done really well. So I can say that, and if anyone needs any quick one pot meals, I have ideas for dinners, come to me. I'm happy to share. I have three Oshi Glow cookbooks. I use them all the time. So well done, thank you, and I'll keep spreading. Um, I really appreciate it, thanks. Thank you for sharing. And uh, that reminded me, nutritional yeast. I love, we, we go through that, tons of it. It's it that, that cheesy flavor without the, the fat and the cholesterol of cheese. Um, we add it to everything, uh, soups, sauces, curries, uh, so good. Oh, I'm glad you brought up cheese. It was the hardest thing to give up, and I get it. Okay, um, I actually found a recipe where you take a plant-based milk, add a tablespoon of, of olive oil, you thicken it with cornstarch and potato starch, and you add nutritional yeast for flavor and a little bit of Dijon mustard, and it makes this cheesy spread, and I had missed grilled cheese sandwiches, and now I don't miss them anymore. And I've actually used this for a fake macaroni and cheese, and it gets the right consistency. So you can actually make very simple your own cheese as well. Um, I noticed that in the slides, the studies were kind of vague about like where it was just chronic kidney disease. Are there going to be any plant-based studies for the glomerular diseases, more specifically the cholesterol um, stubborn FSGS? Because I would be really interested in, in knowing like a long-term study of how that could benefit an aggressive disease like FSGS. Yeah, um, I, I hope there will be. I, there has been some uh, discussion within the nephrology community about doing this. I don't know if they've gotten off the ground yet. Um, because of the lack of funding, we're just happy to get any sort of studies in the kidney disease space. Um, the, the future will be to have studies on individual disease processes, uh, FSGS, uh, you know, a whole trial on minimal change, uh, lupus, uh, all of these things, that would be the future. What I will say for patients with cholesterol uh, problems because of nephrotic range proteinuria, you could definitely make a bad thing worse by eating foods that are high in fat cholesterol to increase that cholesterol. I've seen it in my patients. So there is a, a portion that you do control. You may, definitely may not be able to bring it down to a normal range by um, eating healthy uh, because of the disease process, but you could certainly add fuel to a fire by, by eating unhealthy, if you understand, if that makes sense. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this is huge. My daughter has type 1 diabetes and IJ nephropathy, so the dietary worlds are opposing on a lot of subjects, and neither her endocrinologist or nephrologist will tell me anything. They won't, they won't give any direction. So you're kind of out on your own trying to figure these things out, so thank you so much. Um, but I just want to hear it again because the, a couple of the foods you're talking about are on the no, no, no list for kidneys, but will make my kid's life so much easier if she can eat them. So bananas, yes. Okay. Potatoes, yes. Beans, yes. And nuts and nut butter, yes. So um, it's hard to know specifics. In general, these f we're, we're reintroducing foods. All those foods in general should be okay. There may be specific nuances. I don't know. Um, uh, what the, if the particulars are, but in general, yes, these foods are fine. We're, we're, we as a society, as a community, are bringing these foods back to patients with kidney disease uh, because they're some of the healthiest foods on the planet. We realize that by excluding these foods, we're making diabetes worse. People are gaining weight by eating processed foods, and this is not helping anyone's health at all. So all those foods are fine. Um, the, there are ways to do it incorrectly, and I've seen this um, People take this and then they start drinking a lot of juice. 
juices potassium and can shoot uh, potassium levels up. So that's why I, I always say to exclude potassium. And to also work with a dietitian that's familiar with not only kidney disease, but also plant-based diets. Um, I forgot to list my website. I have a website that's just informally made and I try to keep up and maintain it. Um, but it has a list of renal dietitians that are familiar in plant-based diets. It also has links to videos of my talks, uh, papers, other resources. There's a whole, the first thing you go to has all this information. It's called afternoonrounds.com. Uh, the name is because uh, it started decades ago when uh, you know, I just wanted a place to write some things that uh, normally we don't talk about as physicians in morning rounds. <clears throat> Can I add one thing also? There is a study done on cinnamon that helps maintain blood sugar. So for your, for your child, I would recommend using cinnamon as much as possible. If they, hopefully they like cinnamon. Next question. And we'll be around during break. I think there's a break coming up, so feel free to ask us more questions. Yeah, we can do two more questions. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, so I have a six-year-old with a kidney disease, and I was wondering, how do I ensure that my child is receiving all his nutrients if I choose to offer plant-based options, given that the bioavailability in plant-derived foods are lower than in animal-derived foods? That's a good question. So, in general, if people are getting enough calories, they will generally get enough protein and most of the other vitamins and minerals. All diets need to be balanced and planned. Um, so when we see people running into problems is when they restrict their diet and they don't eat any uh, protein sources. And I had one story, um, I was at a conference and the physician was talking about his grandmother uh, or, his, or his mother and the only thing she was eating was tomatoes, avocados, and I think toast. And that was too restrictive a diet, and that led to nutritional deficiencies, and she developed a blood clot. So if you, as long as you're not eating an extremely restrictive diet, uh, and you're getting the, the main food groups, you're getting enough calories, uh, you should be getting all the other important things for growth and life. Um, because this can, people, there, I have seen people uh, do this incorrectly, not intentionally, but unintentionally, just because this is a short topic and what we're trying to teach um, is a lot of information. I always recommend seeing a dietitian at least for a few visits just to make sure you're going on the right track um, because you don't want to run into problems years down the road or later with not having enough protein or missing B12 if you do a plant-based diet. There's some supplementations that are important. Vitamin, we, in our clinic, we tell everyone to take a vitamin B12 supplement. Uh, plant-based diets tend to be lower in that. In the north, we tell everyone to take vitamin D because there's not enough, not enough sunlight. Here in Florida, it's not a big an issue. Uh, so there's a few nuances above and beyond what we talked about. I was just gonna make one suggestion. If you haven't heard of it, there's a group called Global Renal Exercise Group. It's um, all about uh, the role of exercise and improving renal rehabilitation. Um, but there's research studies there that are going on look at the role of exercise, but they could certainly um, utilize diet in some of those studies. So happy to talk with you about that afterwards and there is funding for that. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs>